Let, let's go up here if we can. Um, say that with me. The press. Say it louder. The press. Okay. I'm going to combine the message this morning along with the message this coming Wednesday night on um, first Wednesday. It's a Sunday morning experience on a Wednesday night. And after I give the introduction and talk this morning, I know you'll want to come Wednesday night and hear the conclusion. But I want to talk about uh, on this service and we'll combine it with Wednesday night, the press. And we'll read other verses momentarily, but we're looking primarily today at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14. I'll look at some other portions of Philippians 3 in a minute, but find this in your Bible. If you have your cell phone, you can download the YouVersion Bible app notes, and uh, we'll have a lot of things on the screen. Uh, But let's get started with Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect but I press on everybody say press on I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own brothers I do not consider that I have made it my own but one thing I do everybody say one thing thing. not five things not ten things not everybody else's thing. Not what everybody else thinks should be my thing. But I said one thing. Come on, say it with me. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is lying ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love that video. Thank you, Pastor Michelle, for uh, making that. All of those athletics, all of those action pictures. You know, in every athletic contest, whether it's a race, whether it's a fight, whether it's a game, the most intense part of the athletic contest is always referred to as the press. There's the moment of action. There's the moment of press. There, there's the moment of activity. Maybe it's a fourth and long at the end of the game, and it's an obvious passing situation, but the defense on the other team doesn't wait to see if the offense is going to score a touchdown. What do they do? They blitz because they're going to press the offense. They're not going to wait and see what happens. They're going to force the action. They're going to press it. The heavyweight lifter on the bench, he's got the maximum amount on the bar so that the bar is bending and yet he pushes his shoulders back and he presses that bar. He presses it to lift the higher weight than possible. The prize fighter that's pressing the match towards the last round, he's waiting for the opportunity to take the fight to the other guy. He's not going to wait and let the guy knock him out. He's going to knock him out. He's, He's pressing forward. I don't know if you saw the video there, if you knew what you were watching, but in 2001, Lance Armstrong is headed up Alp d'Huez. That's a mountain slope in France. And he looks behind. Did you see that? That's historically called the look. Lance Armstrong looks behind and he sees John Ulrich. Larry will like this. He sees his, his number one rival behind him and he turns around and he gives him the look. And you heard the commentary of Phil Liggett says, is anybody coming with me? Is anybody coming with me? And I guess the answer was no. No. And Lance Armstrong just rides right up on that mountain unopposed because he knew the moment of attack and he pressed it against his opponent. Your beloved bolts at the end of the third period are down by one. So what do they do, Karen? They pull the goalie because they're going to press the action. They're not going to hope and wait that they might get a goal. They're going to press and they're going to sacrifice leaving an open goal because they're pressing into the opportunity to take it against their opponent. My frame of reference is in basketball. The coach would say to us, Coach Larry Pummel, I was playing high school basketball. Coach Larry Pummel, we didn't have 
have a big team, but we were an aggressive team. We weren't the best team, but we were the best coach team. We weren't the most athletic team, but we were in the best athletic competition. And Coach Larry Pummel would say, okay, guys, this is the moment. We got to do it. When the ball goes through the net and they score their next basket, when you put, when they pull the ball or, or when we pull the ball, the, our next basket, they pull the ball out of the net. When they turn around, there better be a full court press in place. We're going to shift the momentum of the game. And a basketball team that is better coached and in better condition may not be as talented, may not be as big, may not be as strong, but can take the game to the other team and can surprise them with a full court press and they can shift the momentum and they can move forward. How many are tracking with me today? Have I getting some of your competitive juices going? Come on. Come on, how, how many feel like getting in the ring right now? And, and how many feel like getting on the bike right now and riding with Larry and I? How many feel like doing about 40 miles a second? Come on, come on, come on. We don't have many mountains in Florida, but we got a few hills. And uh, we're going to turn around. I'm, I'm going to talk today on this last Sunday of the year about pressing. Everybody say pressing. pressing. Pressing into the prize of the high call of God for your life. If you believe that 2024 is going to be a good year, and I do. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, 2024 is going to be an awesome year. I believe that 2024 is going to be the best year ever for Family First. I believe it's going to be the best year ever for my life. I'm going to be turning 66 years old a week from today. And I believe the best is yet to come. The best years of my life are not behind me. The best years of my life are yet ahead of me. There's going to be more work done for the kingdom. 2024 is going to be a year of advancement and acceleration and I want you to press into the prize of the high calling of God for your life. So starting this morning and then finishing up on Sunday night, I'm going to talk to you about seven components of the press. Seven things that you must do to press towards the high call of God for your life. Already sounds like an epic Pastor Coates message, doesn't it? How many things are there? There's always seven things. Seven things we're going to press into. I believe we can put on a full court press in 2024. I'm not going to wait and let the devil bring his best came to me. I'm going to take it to him. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to cower in the corner and wait till he lands a left crook. I'm going to go and I'm going to force the action. I'm going to take him out before he has an opportunity. And I believe that in this country and literally around the world, there is a cry today because it's time for a full court press against the kingdom of darkness. There's a rising cry for action. There's a rising cry for leadership, for bravery, for acceleration. We want to grow spiritually. We want to grow numerically. We want to grow financially. We want to grow and it's time to pull out all the stops. It's time to let there be an all advance, all out, all hands on deck, forward acceleration for the kingdom. Are you with me? Say, Pastor Coates, I thought New Year's Eve was just kind of a moment of reminiscing. You can sit down and you can reminisce about the past if you want to. But Pastor Cleo and I are leaving the past behind. We're pressing into the future for the destiny of the prize of the high calling of God for our lives. Are you with me? Seven steps in your pursuit of the upward call of God for your life. I want you to get your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Now, I'll have some things on the screen, but some things you need to look at your scriptures. And you can download version notes and you can follow along. But I want to read a little bit starting in verse 7 of Philippians chapter 3. Okay, Philippians 3, 7. Paul says, but whatever gain I had, you say, what's he talking about? If you look up a couple of verses, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee as to zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness under the law, I was blameless. He said, I had a pretty good pedigree. Last year, he said, I, I, I was doing okay. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ 
and be found in him, not having a righteousness my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then he says, verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. And then here he gives us our key text, verses 12, 13, and 14. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God for my life. How many are interested in going forward? I don't mean to be mean-spirited this morning, but I'm just as sincere as I can be. If you're interested in saying where you're at, you might as well take a break. You, you might as well snooze through this one. I'm not looking for pew sitters. I'm not looking for people that are just breathing up oxygen in this place. I'm looking for people that know who they are. They know who their God is. They know that God has an assignment on their life. They know the time is short. They know what we must work while it is yet day for the night cometh that no man can work. And I'm working for people that can accelerate into the destiny of the purposes of God for their life. I mean, if we've never got down to business with the kingdom before, it's about time. Come on, Miss Irene, help me. It's about time. It's about time. We've just stood around and played games and messed around. And the devil, to many respects, is having his heyday with our culture. And the church is looking back, criticizing and, and talking and trying to politicize the problem. It's time that we realize there's not a political answer. There's a kingdom answer. And if we'll get all out the business of our God and work and serve and be the church instead of talking about doing churchy things, then we can advance the kingdom in these days there's great opposition today I'm telling you what there's great opposition today can I tell you what right now how many thinks the culture is already crazy how many want a positive word here this morning I'm telling you the truth it's going to get worse say pastor Coates I came to church to get a positive word today can't you please give me a positive I'll give you a positive word I am absolutely positive of the fact that it's going to get worse I am absolutely positive of the fact that people are out of their ever-loving minds. And they're not getting back in because they don't know they're out. They're deceived. Deceiving one another and being deceived by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But you and I, we're the answer. Instead of pointing the finger and crit I had now play sound on play saying all this here this morning, but instead of pointing the finger and criticizing and trying to politicize and, and trying to say everybody else needs to do something, we need to start being the church rather than just coming into this four walled building on Sunday morning and doing church things and realize the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now, we're a part of the kingdom, and this kingdom can advance because the kingdom of God has suffered at violence, but the violence shall take it by force and will advance the kingdom in great opposition. Can you handle seven things today? Number one, seven steps, seven things in the press, components of a full court press against the enemy. Number one, you must constantly realize that you have not yet arrived. If you don't know that you're not there yet, you'll never get there. If you're thinking you're already there, then you don't even know where you at. The moment that you think you've arrived, you haven't. Unless you continue to realize you haven't arrived, you will never arrive. The Apostle Paul said, Philippians 3.12, Not that I have already obtained this or am already made perfect. He says, I know I haven't made it yet. Even the great Apostle Paul. Now, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, he's everybody in this room's hero. He ought to be. I mean, he served Jesus relentlessly. And yet he said to us, I have not made it yet. And we said, well, you're the Apostle Paul. What have you not made yet? Well, the answer's in verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. And, and I want you to look at those for a moment. But if, there, if there's something that he has not yet attained yet, then we ask ourselves, what is it that he has not yet attained? Are, are you with me? Come on, we're past the salad bar. We're, we're getting into some meat now. Number one, he's not talking about his salvation, okay? Not talking about getting saved. 
He, he's not, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and he wrote this, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's past tense. He's not saying, I haven't arrived yet. I'm not yet saved. He, he's not saying that. He knows who he is. He knows he's saved by the power of God. Secondly, he's not talking about some sort of arrival in the kingdom. Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless the one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the apostle Paul knows he's born again. He's already in right relationship with Jesus. Therefore, he's already in the kingdom. So if he's not asking for salvation to come, and if he's not asking that someday the kingdom will come, well, well, what is he asking for? Well, let me give you another one. Number three, he's not asking or waiting to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. Have you ever said, heard, heard people say, so, oh, Lord, help me be seated with Christ in heavenly places. How many know you can't pray for something to happen that's already true? Paul wasn't asking to be seated with Christ in heavenly places because Ephesians 2, 5 says, even when we were dead in transgressions, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised, R-A-I-S-E-D is past tense, raised us up with him and seated, another past tense term, with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So he's not saying I haven't gotten saved yet. He's not saying I haven't arrived in the kingdom yet. He's not saying I haven't been seated in heavenly places yet. He hasn't even, he's not even saying I haven't got blessed yet. Because Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heaven. So what, could, what on earth could he be talking about? He's not saying I haven't gotten saved yet. He's not saying I'm not in the kingdom yet. He's not saying I'm not in heavenly places yet. He's not saying I'm not blessed with all. So what's he talking about? Well, in verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, he breaks it down. Here's what he says. He says, I've still got a burning desire. Here's what I've not yet obtained. I still have a desire. I'm still pursuing to gain Christ, to be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He says, I'm still growing. I'm still pressing. I'm still desiring to know him in the power of his resurrection. I'm still desiring. I'm still pressing to and may share in his suffering so that I can become like him even in his death. And he says, ultimately, I'm still pressing and I'm still uh, desiring that by any means possible, I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, obviously, he hadn't attained the resurrection from the dead yet because he hadn't died. I know this is rocket science for some people, but you can't be raised from the dead if you haven't died. So he's saying, I haven't, I haven't experienced that yet. So what is he saying? There's some things I'm still pursuing. There's some things that God has for me that I'm still pressing into. And he calls it the upward call of God for his life. It's the will of God. It's the purposes of God. It's the plans of God. It's what I would like to call and talk to you today about the destiny of God for my life. The upward call of God is Paul's way of referring to the full destiny of God for his life. Do you know God has a destiny for you? Now track with me. That's not a elusive word that's not like a theoretical word that's not like a mystical word some people oh destiny it's like oh god has a destiny it's just like providence whatever the plans of god for her are for me i they'll just automatically happen nonsense the bible has a greek word for that it's balonos <laughs> it will not happen unless you pursue it the plans of God for you will not be fulfilled unless you're pressing into it. Unless you're resisting the devil, he will not flee from you. Unless you're pressing into the future, the future will not overtake you. Unless you're pursuing the high call of God, the high call of God will never be manifest in your life. You want to know what the destiny of God is? Ephesians 2.10, I think this is the definition of divine destiny. You ought to take a screenshot of this off the screen. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works here which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared them beforehand, okay? 
Before the foundations of the world, he knew you would come into the world. He prepared a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life, and he's got it all mapped out. But just because he has a destiny for you doesn't mean that it will automatically be fulfilled unless you passionately pursue it. Amen. Unless you discover it. Unless you pursue it. Unless you press into it. It's just things that God has prepared for us to walk in. And I'm going to have a little bit of a, a pushback here for you. How many have ever heard this expression that the culture uses a lot? I've heard this a lot. And I, I hear it a lot from younger people, not to criticize younger people, but it's just that's the people I run with. And I, I hear them say things like, it's not, not necessarily church people, but, you know, just in the culture, they say, well, you got to lean into this. How many have ever heard people say that? Oh, you need to lean into this. Here's an opportunity. You ought to lean into this. You got to lean into that. I got news for you. You're not going to fulfill the destiny of, your, of the call of God on your life by leaning into anything. You might lean into the call of God like you're leaning against this wall. Your purpose is not to stand there and keep that wall from falling down. Your purpose is to not lean into something but, but press into it. Your purpose is not to stand around hoping something might overtake you, but press and overtake the destiny of the prize of the high call of God for your life. It's not about leaning into anything. It's not about waiting. It's not just like sitting around hoping it'll happen. It's about passionately pursuing and aggressively, violently attacking the future that God has for you and pursue it with every ounce of energy that you've got within you. Lance Armstrong didn't wait for Jan Ulrich to attack him. He attacked him first. The Bolts don't wait till the other team decides to get tired and leave the goal open. They pull their goalie so that they're overmatching the opponent and they can press the match towards them. I'm looking for some aggressive people here in this room. Come on. I'm looking for some people that want to passionately pursue. The, uh, this, the, we're not looking for pew setters in 2024. I'm a serious, and I don't mean to be mean spirit here this morning, but God is going to continue. And I know this is like holiday Sunday, but you better get used to it because every other Sunday the rest of this year is going to be like it was last Sunday. You got to get here early to get a good seat because the place is going to fill up. And it might be that people are going to start coming here and they're going to get here earlier than what you get here and when they get here earlier than what you get here they might get in the seat that you thought is yours and I'm going to tell you no that seat don't got your name on it sweetheart that's not reserved for you that's reserved for the first person that gets here that's passionately pursuing the plans of God for their life get me fired up here this morning on this New Year's Eve service but I've been sitting in this seat for 40 years well, good Lord, you've been sitting in that seat for 40 years. It's about time you give it up for somebody else. I've been in this. Uh, here's what the old timers used to say. Everybody doing okay here this morning? All right, I'm going to get back up here where the notes are in a moment. Pray, pray, pray for me, Tyler, that I get back on the notes. But I'll get back up here in a minute. But for the meantime, we're just kind of chewing the cabbage, okay? Here's what the old timers used to say. Well, bless God, I've been in the way. For 40 years. You ever heard that expression? Here's my response. Well, why don't you get out of the way then? I mean, why don't you let somebody else move and, and, and get past you if you're still in the way? I'm looking for people that will pursue something. And step number one is what? You got to realize you haven't made it yet. Now, I got busy there. But Paul is saying... I'm already saved. I'm in the kingdom. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly realms. I'm already blessed with every spiritual blessing. But that doesn't mean I'm just coasting to get to heaven. I'm passionately pursuing the destiny of the prize of a high call of God Amen. for my life. Number two. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, we're going to move a little quicker now. Number two. And each one of these has an adjective. It has a qualifier. If you must constantly realize that you haven't yet arrived, then number two, you must consistently, everybody say, keep on. You must keep on consistently forgetting what is behind. Philippians 3.13. One thing I do, not eight things, not five things, not everybody else's thing, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. I'm not going to linger on this, but it's an obvious truth. You cannot move forward while you're looking back. 
You cannot steal second base with your foot still planted firmly on first base. You can't forget what you keep on remembering. You can't let other people forget about what you keep talking about. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're shouting here this morning. Put, put this press point up here for me. How many have got things in your past that you'd like to forget about? Can I see your hands? How many have got some things in your past that you'd like other people to forget about? I've got a recommendation for you. Then stop talking about it. Because death and life is in the power of the tongue. By our words, we will be committed and by our words, we'll be condemned. And if you want everybody else to forget about your mistakes, then stop reminding them. If you want everybody else to forget about your past sins, if you want the, if you want the devil to forget about your sins, then stop reminding him every day. Oh, it's getting quiet here in this Presbyterian church here this morning. I, I said, stop talking about what you want other people to forget about. The human memory can be our greatest spiritual blessing or our greatest detriment. And it all depends on what we remember and what we choose to forget. We often choose to remember the things that we should always forget and we forget the things that we should always remember. Come on, that's a mouthful. So remember that you must constantly keep on forgetting the past. I'm not saying forget the lessons you've learned. I'm not saying forget the people that have helped you get to where you are. But I'm saying stop thinking and remembering the sins, and the failures, and the mistakes, and the wrong ideas, and the wrong thinking. You, sometimes you've got to realize that the problem is thinking, stinking thinking, and, and stop thinking about it. And then press on. Are you ready? Three? Got to get to seven here. Number three. You must clearly, everybody say clearly. clearly. You must clearly envision the future. You've got to see it before you'll ever be it. You've got to know where you're going if you expect to ever arrive there. You've got to have a focus. You've got to have the GPS logged into the destination if you expect to arrive at the destination. Just because you're having motion doesn't mean you're moving forward. You might just be going in circles and you might be going fact backwards. But you've got to envision the future that God has for you. Paul said this, forgetting what is behind and straining. Everybody say straining. Straining towards what lies ahead. Now that word in the Greek text is an interesting word. I'm not going to try to pronounce it for you and it's not necessarily important. But the Greek word there in that verse literally means to strain or to stretch out, to stretch forward. And it literally is the picture of, for example, a, a runner that is running the race and he went, when he gets close to the finish line, he stretches out to break the tape. It's like the bike rider. When he's going to cross the line, he throws his bike forward because he's straining, he's pressing. You ever uh, been behind people that you can't see what you want to see and so you got to stretch your neck and look over them? Come on, get with me. You got to stretch your neck and look around people. You got to raise up on your tiptoes and look over people. Because a lot of times you can't see what God wants you to see because other people are in the way. And you're looking at them rather than keeping your eyes on Jesus. Come on. And so what you got to do is you got to look around. You got to look over. You got to look. You got to stretch beyond the people that are in the way. So that you can envision what lies ahead. And that is the picture here of pursuing the purposes of God for our lives. If I can see it, then I can be it. And if I can fix my focus on it, I can achieve it. But if I can't see it, I'll never get there. Because Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, help me church, the people perish. Modern rendering says where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no word picture of where they're going, they're not going to stay on the right path. And they're going to wander off. They're going to get distracted. They're going to get lost. They're going to go in the wrong directions and take detours that God never intended because they don't have a focus on the destiny of where God has taken them. I've got a lot of this impacted into this this morning, so I'm just going to really focus and keep moving, but we're ready for number four. Okay? Are you tracking with me so far? Let's review. Number one, you must constantly realize you haven't yet arrived. Number two, you must um, 
consistently keep on forgetting the past. Number three, you must clearly envision the future. Number four, you must relentlessly. Say relentlessly. relentlessly. You must relentlessly pursue your destiny. Not only you must you see it, but you must passionately, relentlessly pursue it. Paul said in the 14th verse, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here's a literal translation. Okay, go ahead and put up that next screen if you would, Robert. I want to walk the people through this. A lot of times we put up different Bible versions. You know, my Bible of choice right now is the ESV, English Standard Version. There's the King James. There's the NIV. There's all of those. This one might, you could call the TRC, okay? If you don't get it, just ask Karen because she giggled. But here's the literal, tra- the Timothy Ray Coates version, okay? Here's the TRC version. Some of this comes from the Amplified Bible, but you break it down. It says, I passionately pursue. That means dioko. Dioko there is the word pursue. I'm pressing. I'm passionately pursuing and pressing into what? The goal. Which the goal is what? The goal is the word scopos. What, what does that kind of sound like? A, 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 a viewing device. Whether it's a telescope or a microscope, it's a scope. It's something that you look through. So I'm passionately pursuing. I'm diocoing. I'm pursuing passionately. I'm, I'm looking through the lens, the scopos, and I can clearly see through the lens of the long-range telescope, which is the prize, the brabion of the destiny of the upward call of God for me in Christ Jesus. Now let me just break this down for you explain it he says i'm passionately pursuing the goal the goal is to look through the telescope and get a long range view and if i look through the telescope of the long range lens i can see the prize now the prize he's talking about is not an earthly prize it's not like an ivy wreath that they would put on the winners of the ifmian games in the ancient times the prize is not the gold medal that the olympian is going to win the prize is not the stanley cup the prize is not the yellow jersey the prize is not the lit- Vince Lombardi trophy but what is the prize the prize is knowing that I have obtained the upward call of God the destiny for my life the prize is knowing that I have been faithful the prize is knowing that I have been consistent to do what God has told me to do and if anybody else doesn't notice it or not my God is going to notice it on the day that I arrive in his presence he's going to say well done Thou good and faithful servant. Now this may not mean much to everybody, but means a lot to this guy. The prize is not to fill the building with people. The prize is to be consistent to the word of God for my life. The prize is not necessarily to have a name and a reputation. The prize is not to be known in Spring Hill. The prize is not to be known on social media. The prize is not to be known on the accolades of men. The prize is to be known in the heavens that I have been faithful to what God has called me to do. I knew some of this was going to get on me this morning. It was starting to warm up in the first service, so stay with me. The prize is to stand before Almighty God. Remember in our series we did on identity? Remember that video we had every Sunday? The prize is on the day that I die to stand before God and look Him right square in the eyes and say, God, I did my best. Not, oh, well, you know, I should have tried a little harder. You know, well, maybe, you know, I, I should have been a little more serious. Maybe I should have, maybe I should have did this. Or, no, I'll take your woulda, shoulda, coulda's and just shove them down the drain. Forget what is behind. And strain towards what is ahead. And know that God will forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed. And if God has already forgotten about it, then stop reminding God about it. Because if you stand before God and you'll say, I'm sorry I didn't do this. He'll say, what sins are you talking about? I put those under the blood. They're forgotten. If I can't even remember them anymore, then why are you remembering them anymore? Satan's is the one that remembers our past. And I love the philosophy of that great singer, songwriter, entertainer that was... Now in heaven, but uh, Carmen, 
that said, when Satan starts reminding you of your past, start reminding him of his future. I, 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 think, that's a per, I think that's pretty good advice. When he starts telling you where you used to be, start telling him where you're going to be. When he starts singing that song, na, 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 you're not what you ought to be. Then you just sing it right back to him. Same song, second verse. Na, 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 I'm not what I used to be. And then put on the last verse. I'm not what I'm going to be. Because I'm pressing. I'm pushing forward. I'm 60. Did I say this already? My wife told me I need to stop talking about how old I am. So I can't remember if I said it in the first. But I got a birthday. One week from today is going to be my birthday. I don't know if you knew that. So you can just make out checks and send them to 4166 Lima Drive. Happy birthday to me. But I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'll be 66 years old. But I'm not looking to retire. I'm not looking to sit down. I'm not, I'm not looking to just hope I make it to the end. I want to see more things happen for the kingdom of God in the next five to ten years than have happened in the last 25 for the glory of God and the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus. This is what Paul said. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Everybody okay? All right. Number five. Here's the love test, okay? There was one coming, so here it is. You must carefully, everybody say carefully. Carefully. You must carefully listen for God's correction. Philippians 3.15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise... You gotta love Paul's. There's such irony in this verse. I don't know if you see the humor of this verse. I mean, sometimes you just gotta sit and laugh at the Bible. And if you don't think the Bible is entertaining, you must have never read it before. Because here's what the Apostle Paul says Let those of us who mature think this way. You gotta read between the lines here. And if anything you think otherwise, in other words, if you're immature, then, well, God will straighten you out eventually. That, that's really what he's saying. God, God will correct you eventually. How many know you got to listen carefully sometimes to the correction of God? Because God's not a cheerleader. God's a coach. God's not interested in your affirmation. He's interested in your victory of the prize of the high calling of God. He's not interested in your feelings. He's interested in your productivity. He's not interested in making you feel warm and fuzzy. He's interested in you being powerful and productive for the kingdom. I love that analogy. He's not a cheerleader. He's a coach. Because the cheerleaders cheer everything. They cheer your fumbles as well as your touchdowns. Maybe because they don't know the difference. I, I, I'm not real sure. That's not a blonde joke, but if you take it personally, then if the shoe fits, wear it. If not, kick it down the pew. But God's not a cheerleader. I told the early service, I guess I could tell this service. I'm 14 years old, 15 maybe. I'm a freshman in high school, first time to play competitive athletic uh, scholastic basketball, Pastor Cleo, and I'm on the free throw line, first game of the year. I'm, I'm getting all set up to do my free throw. And out of my ear, I heard the cheerleaders all lined up. Tim, Tim, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. And I'm thinking, oh, I, I got distracted. I mean... I never heard girls call my name, but now all, all six of them are lined up in a row and they're chanting in unison, Tim, Tim, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. And I mean, I don't, I think I just fumbled right there. I, I think I'd, I, I, don't, I don't have any idea if I made that basket or, or not. Pro- probably not because, man, it, it, man it, it was just overwhelming to me. Now you think I'm silly. I'd like to hear your story sometime. Don't you guys sit there and look at me like you got it all fixed up. I know when you were 15 years old, you were stupider than a mud fence. And, 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 you, and you just had your mind on, on girls all the time. At least I didn't think about girls all the time. I thought about basketball part of the time. But anyway. All right. 
Got to rein this thing in. Structure, discipline. But so you got to listen to the coach's correction. Travis Kelsey, last Sunday, got mad. Threw his helmet down. Banged it on the ground. One of his teammates, all of you saw this. Now, they're going to redeem themselves today. You say, Pastor Coates, I'm going to pray for you and the Chiefs. Please do, because we can use the prayer and you can use the practice. But uh, Travis Kelsey threw his helmet down. And one of his buddies picked up the helmet. He's running over there to give it. And Coach Shandy reads, don't give him his helmet back. He threw his helmet down. Let him go pick it up himself. You saw that, didn't you? Because Coach Reed is not a cheerleader. He's a trainer. And he wants, and I'm convinced Kelsey and Mahomes, they'll come out today a little more focused. I'm not a prophet. I'm just telling you. They'll come out more focused. So if you're concerned about my Chiefs, don't be. Worry about your team. Don't worry about my team. My team's going to be okay. And if they aren't, well, then I'll eat my words next Sunday. Everybody okay? Should we put a caboose on this thing? All right. Number, where are we at? Number six. You must aggressively... Pursue mentorship in your life. Here's what Paul says. Brothers, verse 17, join in imitating me. Oh, I'm not going to imitate anybody. I don't have any heroes in my life but Jesus. I don't need people in my life. I can sit home and watch internet church. I don't need a preacher telling. I don't want to imitate other people. I'm just going to follow Jesus. Well, then you're not Paul. Because here's what he said. Join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for you to obtain the prize of the high calling of God without other people in your life. I'm not going to linger here, but boy, I could. Because there is a disease that is eating the productivity of the American church alive. And that is the philosophy that a lot of people have that is straight from the pit of hell. And it's, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Yeah, you don't have to go to McDonald's to be a Happy Meal. But if you get close enough, at least you can smell the French fries. And you can know the desire is there. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Anybody that's been saved for five minutes knows that. But you do have to go to church to be an accountable member of the body of Christ and be productive in the ability of your assignment and work together for the kingdom. I'm running out of wind here. A lot of people love Jesus. They just don't like his body. I think you missed that. A lot of people love Jesus. They just don't like his church. Well, guess what? You don't get to pick and choose what you want and what you don't want. It comes as a package. Jesus loved the church so much he gave his life for the church. A lot of people don't love Jesus enough to turn off YouTube and come to church on Sunday morning. Preaching better you're shouting here this morning. So let's, uh, let's finish this up. Number seven. You must prayerfully identify and eliminate wrong people from your life. Now, I'm going to finish this on Wednesday night. And this will be my point to develop on Wednesday night seven people that you don't need in your life. Now, I'm not giving you seven names. It's not seven neighbors. It's not seven people (laughs) on, on, on your contact list that you need to send a goodbye to. No, I'm talking about seven kinds of people. Okay? Notice what the scripture says, Philippians 3.18. I told you, even now, I will tell you again with tears, there are people, number one, that walk as enemies of the Christ. You don't need those people in your life. Their end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is set in heaven. And from it we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Meredith, if you'll help me. 
Right things start happening whenever wrong people start leaving your life. I'm going to talk to the teenagers Wednesday night, but some of you are still in your teens. And a lot of people, after they've been saved about four or five years, maybe even ten years, they go what I like to call spiritual adolescence. They go, well, I've been saved for 12 years now, and I know it all. How many know a 12-year-old wannabe teenager doesn't know it all? A person that's been saved a short while does not know it all. But they need the mentorship of people, and they need to take good advice and sometimes love some people long distance. I'm going to prophesy and I'm going to close. There's some people in your life today that will not be in your future. Not that you don't love them. Not that you wouldn't love to bring them along with you. Not like if you were in the boat and they threw Jonah over that you would not be the person with a huge mercy gift. And you would find the life raft and throw the rope on it and throw out to Jonah and try to save him. Not realizing that God prepared a fish for Jonah. Jonah's point of correction was going to come at the hand of the decision that God had ordained, not an overblown mercy gift of people that were going to keep enabling him. And there are some people that don't qualify to be in your future. You know why? They know where you're going. They see the price that you're paying to get there, and they're not willing to pay that price. So instead of paying the price to go with you to where you're going, they will try to pull you back so that you can't go where you want to go so they can keep you where they want you to be because they're not willing to make the commitment and pay the price to be where you are going in the destiny that God has for you. And you don't be mean spirited about it. You don't send them an announcement. You don't write them down a note and say, I just want you to know that Pastor Coates taught me this morning, you're one of the seven people that I'm kicking out of my life. Please don't do that. If you do that, tell them you went to First Baptist Church, not Family First, please. But just move away. Just, just move away. You don't have to conf- have a confrontation. You really don't have to make a big deal out of it. Just don't feel obligated to respond in 30 seconds every time a negative text comes. I'll I'll deal with that in a few days. If I don't, well, then they'll just have to wait. Because when they send up preaching better than your shouting here this morning, there are certain toxic people that will send you a text just trying to get in your buttons and get you to respond within 30 seconds to manipulate you and know that they're going to control your thoughts. I'm not obligated to answer that text. I'm not obligated to pick up that phone call because I'm identifying places that I'm going. And there's some that are going there with me, but there's some that will probably not arrive because they're not willing to leave the train station and get on board and go where I'm going. So I want you to stand with me this morning. And I want to pray over you. I've had this sinus congestion and kind of a bronchial thing since last Sunday afternoon. and I was just praying that I'd make it through the whole day today. I think I'm going to make it. If there's one of these seven things that uh, the Holy Spirit is quickening to your heart that you need to apply, then just prayerfully make a commitment to God right now. Maybe you're one of those that doesn't realize you haven't made it yet. God needs to awaken you to the fact that there's more. And you'll only get there when you begin to apply spiritual principles from the Bible in your life. You may be one of those that God's got a correction on the horizon for you. Don't get angry about it. Don't get mean-spirited. Don't get rebellious. Because true character is always revealed at the point of spiritual correction and if spiritual correction comes your way then just take it and say thank you God for loving me enough to correct me because I really sincerely want to be everything that you want me to be 
If you keep talking about the past, then the past will keep talking back to you. But forget those things. I don't know which one of these things is important to you. But just latch a hold of it and say, that's my takeaway from today. Because I'm going to press forward to the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus for my life. Lift your hands across the room here this morning. I just think we ought to have a little bit of a response time. Pastor Meredith, maybe you have something that we can sing. Something that we can just kind of wrap our hearts around as we begin to close this today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.
Oh, come on, put your hands together. Let's give the Lord praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So if you need to know who the seven people are, you got to come Wednesday night, okay? There's Jim and there's John and there's Frank. No, 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 not seven people. Seven kinds of people you don't need in your future. You can't take them with you. They will drag you back, but you can go on into the destiny of God. So blessings on you. Have an awesome, awesome day today. Uh, Happy New Year. Be blessed today. In Jesus, we love you much.